Hello, my name is Melissa Daniels, and this is Strabismus to Stereopsis. And on this channel, we talk all about strabismus and having an eye turn and how to overcome that, how to get your eyes straight and working together. And today we are going to be diving into some of Dr. David Cook's strategies for working with patients with esotropia. He recently published a research article and the results of that research were amazing. He has like an 86% success rate with esotropia. And so today I'm gonna to kind of dive into what his protocol for esotropia patients is. Before jumping into that, be sure to go over to learn.strabismussolutions.com. Over there, you can get access to all the different resources that I have. If you are wondering if this protocol or these strategies could work for you, you can always book a Zoom call with me. We can talk about it there. I can help you find a vision therapy office or a surgeon, depending on what route you wanna go. You can also take my course, get one of the downloads. There's just a lot of options, so be sure to check that out. This protocol for isotropia is based on the research article by Dr. Cook. It's an amazing document, 45 pages long. It has so much great information. I highly recommend that you read it. I will put the link in the description. It's called A Treatise on Redefining Success in Optometric Vision Therapy for Strabismus based on a case series of 75 patients. A couple weeks ago, we talked about what Dr. Cook is redefining as success. What does success as a patient with esotropia look like? His three main criteria are one, they need to have less than eight diopters of an eye turn. So like my eyes are about eight when I look in the distance. So if you can tell that my eye is turning a little in and up, that is about eight. So it's very, it's not very noticeable. My eyes look pretty good, but yeah, they're not perfect. So eye turn has to be less than eight. They have to have measurable stereo vision. Um, basically a minimum, they have to be able to see the stereo fly, which is one of those stereo tests of the doctor, you know, does the fly look like it's floating? That's a minimum. They have to at least be able to see that depth. That's more of like a peripheral type fusion, like a more gross fusion, I guess would be a better name for it. And then the big one is real life spatial awareness. So being able to judge distances and see the space in the real world. In the therapy room, this translates a little bit differently in how they were actually measuring it. Um, they're measuring it with like something called silo. You don't need to worry about that. So anyways, that is what his success is. So basically eyes that are working pretty well together. So you have good depth perception and they look straight. That's pretty simple. He had to give it some numbers so that when he's you know putting all the numbers into his calculations, he can actually give some results. In this study, when we look at that criteria he had for success, the success rates were really great. He divided it into people with less than 15 diopters and people with more than 15 diopters of an eye turn. And what he found is that the average eye turn in the large angle group went from 26 to four. So they started with greater than 15 and the average was four at the end. So that means a lot of people were sitting at zero and there were some with a minor eye turn still. 80% um, reached all three of those criterion. And then with the group with 15 prism diopters or less, 86 meant the criteria. So it was a little bit more successful with less of an eye turn. And none of these patients use surgery or anything. So he's got all these great results. That's way higher than surgery, which is really exciting to me because you know, sometimes it feels like, oh, if it's greater than 15, you gotta go for the surgery. And he's showing like, no, actually most of, you know, 86% went, or sorry, 80% were aligned, at least cosmetically, after they were done with vision therapy. So that is a huge success to me. So the question is, how did he do it? What's the protocol? What was his focus? How is he doing vision therapy to achieve this result? Because honestly, a lot of offices get somebody with a high, a high angle of esotropia and they're like, ooh, I don't, I don't know if we wanna do that. You've got anomalous retinal correspondence. Oh, we better not. You might get double vision. You know, They kind of shy away from it. And he's like, oh, I'm not worried about it at all. He just says, bring them on in. We're gonna do this. And so he doesn't worry about anomalous retinal correspondence. He just kind of ignores it, honestly, and because that's just not the way he focuses with his esotropic patients. And he does a lot of other things. So I'm gonna go through his list of seven things and try to make it understandable for people who maybe are not, you know, who are, I'm assuming that most of you are patients or parents. And so just as a preface, these are not necessarily in order. I mean, somewhat, you know, he's got it ordered, but depending on the patient and the diagnosis, these things can all be mixed in. You might be doing some, the sum of them the entire time. Some of them might not be till the very end. It just kind of depends. So 
First and foremost is doing eye stretches, making sure that those eyes can move in all directions. I've talked about that a lot on this channel, eye calisthenics. You want to make sure like when you have surgery and you've got those, you know, basically the muscles kind of get stuck and they're just like tired, right? Like if you have a knee surgery and then you never move your knee, you, you lose that flexibility. And so that can happen with your eye muscles too. And so can you actually physically move your eye all the way in all the directions? And especially if you have a direction that like is more difficult or your eyes start shaking in that direction, you focus there. So that's the number one thing or the first thing is, can we even move, physically move our eyes in all these directions? Um, another is the same thing, but moving your eyes from near to far. So your eyes should go out when they look far, in when they look near. And so doing a lot with um, vergence ranges, if the patient, you know, has vergence ranges. And that just means like converging and diverging your eyes. Some, A lot of patients, you know, half the time they can use both eyes together and the other half they can't. Um, so for those patients, it's improving those ranges for when their eyes are aligned. For patients who it's constant and they can never do that, it probably wouldn't start there. Okay, so that was number two. Number three is using double vision as a guide to help you with alignment. So if you've used the Brock string or seen my video on Thumb Pinky Rock, um, it's kind of that concept. So if you just want to try it, if you're looking at your phone or wherever and you hold up your finger between me, or sorry, between you and your phone, you should see one phone and two fingers, right? This is called physiological diplopia. So where you're not looking, you should always see two. And that's actually, that's a good thing. That's when you're supposed to see double. And so using that to kind of guide fusion can be really powerful to help help you be more aware of you know, everything besides where you're looking. A lot of times we tend to hyper-focus and bringing in that physiological diplopia that helps divide your awareness and helps you kind of take in more at one time. So that's number three. Number four, Dr. Cook talks a lot about something called the Zoza and I, you will hear about this in my Mastering Peripheral course as well. The Zoza is your zone of simultaneous awareness. It's basically everything that you're aware of at the same time, not by like jumping your eyes from place to place, but like literally I just keep my eyes still and what else am I aware of in this room, in my space? I can see clouds, I can see a light, I can be aware that when I breathe, my air is like going and moving towards the computer, right? Like I can see the wind blowing trees in the background, right? All without moving my eyes. So that's my zone of simultaneous awareness. That's what I can see all at once without moving my eyes. And he had like, this is a huge step for esotropia patients is learning to expand and condense and just get some control over how big you can see and, and realizing how that affects other visual tasks that you're trying to do, how that can change, how closing down and opening up. So um, growing that zone and then, you know, obviously increasing the zone is a big part of that. <laughs> okay, um, number step number five, and not necessarily step five because who knows if this is all gonna be in order. Um, we're gonna, start working on increasing stereo and the ability to judge that space and decreasing the angle of your eye turn. So this might look like having a 3D target like a vectogram or, um, you know, you've, you've seen my, like something like this where you slide them apart and things look like they're floating. Actually, this is my more favorite one something like this in the office. This is something they would like project on the wall and be like ginormous and huge and it should look like it's floating. And so he isn't worried about like how far can we stretch it? It's more how much can you see that float and be aware of that space and then you're moving back and forward and side to side and stand on one foot and recite the alphabet backwards and can you do all these things and keep that float and have the awareness, your Zoza open and and really having that space. As you do that, as you improve the peripheral fusion and get that space locked in, that's when your eyes will start becoming straight. And he's, he's said that he's found that the peripheral fusion is as effective or more effective than the more traditional like strabismus type exercises that are done. That is a huge portion of the esotropia treatment is getting that space where you're able to see the stereo float but then also doing that at a distance and being able to just be aware of space. Um, in the therapy room, we talk a lot about something called silo. Um, and that's just a concept where things that are, when there you were talking about like a stereo image, something that's like 
you know, 3D, if, if it's coming towards you, it should look like it's actually smaller than like the original. And if it's going away from you, it should look bigger. And a lot of people, you know, if you take someone with normal vision and, and say, look at this, look at this vectogram. Okay, you're, you're looking at this and, you know, the original is a four inch diameter. But when I move it like this, it should look like it's floating here and has a three inch diameter. And if I go like this and move it the other direction, it's back here and it looks like it has a five inch diameter now, right? So that actual size changes. And that, um, Dr. Cook talks a lot about how that is actually more descriptive of how somebody with strabismus is going to use that vision and be able to maintain alignment. That's more powerful than necessarily saying like, I gotta use it again to kind of show you. Um, even if it's just a little tiny bit, right? That's more important than saying, oh, I can still get fusion when I hold them this far apart or this far apart. That's, that's less important than being able to see the silo, that space difference. So that's a big one that they work on in office. But I, I just think, you know, that's so interesting because there are so many times I was in vision therapy and he'd be like, does the size look different? I'd be like, no, it's the exact same size. Like it took me forever to see silo, to see that difference because it's, it's different. Like if you're looking at a, like this pen, if I hold it really close, it looks really big. And if I hold it really far, it looks small, right? Like that's how I judge depth is like how th big things are. Like for 30 years, that's how I did it. And now you're telling me that it's backwards, it's opposite. And anyways, that took me a really, really long time to really lock into that silo, that size difference. And once you start getting that silo, man, the space really opens up. So that's a really big focus. Okay. Wow. That was a big section, but step five is important. It's pretty much the whole time you're going to be doing that. One more thing to add on to that step five is just that while you're doing these 3D activities, he's going to be covering an eye and uncovering it. So when you cover an eye, it breaks the fusion and then you uncover and you have to recover. So he calls it cover, uncover, recover. And so he's doing that a lot. You know, you cover it, the depth collapses maybe after 10 seconds and then you uncover it and it's how quickly can you get it back? How quickly can you recover and get the silo and the depth and the space? So that's a big part of that for him. Okay, his sixth step in his protocol is to move into real space. So instead of having a vectogram or a virtual reality headset or the HoloLens or um, all these different things that make it a little bit easier to see in 3D, you're, you start doing this in to real space. You're looking at a tree and you're seeing the depth and the size changes in the tree, not necessarily silo. You're not going to see silo with a tree, but um, just like seeing that space or there's different um, activities where, you know, you have your two thumbs and you can make a third. Anyways, there's a lot of different like fusion things that are in free space. So then you start moving there and then step seven is to integrate all of those things with your body. So that means like adding rhythm, like a metronome or balance, you know, standing on one foot while doing this, or like I said, reciting the alphabet backwards or solving math equations in your brain or listing categories. Like there's just a million different activities, but you're doing these things to kind of load up the brain. And can you still maintain the space and the depth and that awareness while, while doing all these cognitive tasks because that's what's going to apply into your real life. So the big idea with esotropia, overall, we gotta make sure both eyes are moving in all directions. The periphery has to be completely locked in, not just like a little awareness, but like locked in and like level a billion for periphery and then transferring that over to peripheral fusion, right? So being able to be aware of your periphery and then being able to see 3D targets peripherally and make sense of that. Those are the things that are going, going to give that success he's talking about. When you talk about a behavioral success and his numbers, that's straight eyes, basically, less than eight diopters, and being able to see that fusion. And so I see that space and depth and, you know, the stereo fly, all of those good things. So th that is his thing. And I think a lot of people are like, well, what about the red and green glasses and the bar readers? And what about, um, you know, like there's just a lot of little activities that you would think, well, what about this? Like I see this in all the videos. What about Tetris with the glasses? That's not where it's at for isotropia. For isotropia, 
you're going to get that alignment 10 times more if you learn how to relax your eyes and using your periphery and peripheral fusion is going to relax the eyes faster than anything. So the article is amazing. If you have more questions or want to know more how to apply this into your own vision therapy, uh, I know that as a patient, these principles really helped me to progress more quickly when I realized how important it was to relax and open up that space. That's where my Mastering Peripheral course comes from. It would probably be super beneficial for you if you are struggling with this or you have esotropia and you're having a struggle making progress in vision therapy right now. I think that could really help. You also book a call with me on Zoom. I'd love to talk to you there and help you come up with a strategy as well. So be sure to leave any questions that you have in the comments and we will see you in the next video.